And now I would like to invite uh, Professor Peter Singer to take the floor and enter the stage here with his discussion of this debate, please. Sorry. Yes, we're at the yeah, I think actually, like you, John, uh, I prefer to stand, and maybe the agreement between us would end at that point. <laughs> um, I want to thank uh, both of you for very stimulating discussions of this topic, and uh, it's nice to see an issue that is really squarely joined as this question of freedom has been, and uh, certainly uh, John has made his position very clear. Uh, so. Where, how should we try to take this discussion further? Um, obviously one of the things that philosophers tend to do is to clarify some of the ideas and the concepts that uh, have been used in the discussion. And I think that that's particularly important here because we are talking about freedom, that's the issue. But freedom doesn't just mean one thing, uh, it can mean many different things. And uh, I think it's really important to try to clarify what we're talking about and what the values are in having this discussion. So, um, uh, John, for example, in his uh, presentation, I thought talked about many different things under the umbrella of freedom. And uh, there were some of them with which I would certainly want to agree about the importance of them, and others perhaps less. And I think we need to ask with the particular forms of moral enhancement that are under discussion that Julian has uh, presented for us, we need to ask in what way they may or may not reduce some of these freedoms. Um, at one point, John, you, you referred to the threats to freedom of expression that uh, you and I have both experienced um, and uh, some other people in the bioethics field have. And obviously that is something that I uh, think of as uh, extremely important. Indeed, um, many years ago after, after the experiences that I had in uh, being unable to speak on issues, some issues in bioethics uh, in Germany, uh, I regarded this as something that was very important to preserve. And, uh, together with uh, my colleague Helga Kuza and uh, Dan Wickler, that led us to set up the International Association of Bioethics uh, to provide some sort of international body that was in a position to make statements about the importance of preserving freedom of discussion, freedom of expression in bioethics. And if we think about uh, that kind of freedom, and John finished with quotations from John Stuart Mill, um, we naturally think about Mill and his arguments for freedom of expression, uh, a particular form of political freedom. Uh, John also talked about uh, democracy and some of those forms of political freedom, about the importance of the democratic state, of rule of law, of the ability of citizens in those states to uh, again express themselves freely as part of political debate and then to change governments if they wish to do so, that governments should rule with the consent of the governed. Um, these are also things that I, I entirely share with you, John, that are, are very important political freedoms that we certainly should cherish and we should resist attempts to weaken or destroy. But the question is really why the suggestions for moral enhancement that have been put on the table would in any way weaken or damage those kinds of freedoms. It's not obvious to me that they would. Um, there are an, a, a number of different things. I mean, obviously, that might depend on the ways in which they're implemented, but let's say it's not obvious to me that uh, all possible ways of implementing or, or all the ways that Julian suggested would reduce those political freedoms. The other kind of issue that is, that is up for discussion, of course, is um, 
what we might refer to as moral freedom, our freedom to make uh, moral choices, and John particularly emphasized the idea of acting on those choices. And that requires, I think, more discussion as to what this is, and indeed whether we have this at all. Because the notion of moral freedom that is often presented here is something that is dependent on freedom of the will, um, on the idea that uh, we have the capacity to act in some way that is uh, radically free, and uh, there's obviously been a very long-running and deep philosophical discussion about what that means, uh, whether it means that our actions are not caused in any way, whether we can understand the idea that our actions are not caused in any way, um, or whether there is some form of causation which is compatible with freedom of the will. And I think uh, those questions will be raised when we, if we suggest in some way that the use of means of moral enhancement is going to destroy some moral value that lies in uh, the value of, of making moral choices. The kind of position that um, comes to mind here is a, I, I suppose, a position that we associate with Kant, though I don't want to get into questions of scholarship of Kantian interpretation, whether this is a correct understanding of, of Kant. Um, but we're all familiar with the statement in the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals that the only thing that is good without limitation is a good will. That may be, to, to single out that statement, may, as I say, be a caricature of what Kant's overall position is. Um, but nevertheless, that is a view that is sometimes defended, that there is this uh, immense, uh, perhaps even uh, sole intrinsic value in the idea that we act freely in some way, uh, that we act from a good will. And if that's the view of freedom that is being, that is being defended, and if there is some sense in which uh, we, uh, the idea that we're acting freely would be affected <coughs> by some of the methods that Julian suggested, um, then clearly you do have a problem. You have a problem in, in, in suggesting that uh, we can maintain this kind of freedom while having those forms of moral enhancement. Because the idea here is, I mean, again, roughly within this Kantian model, that uh, we make choices either on the basis of our autonomous self, our rational self, or on the basis of our heteronymous self, which means the self that is affected by our empirical nature, the desires that we have as biological beings, as animals. And um, insofar as uh, we affect our choices by such things as, as uh, taking drugs that may reduce violence, whether it's, uh, let's say, those Ritalin, Adderall type of drugs that uh, may reduce violence, or um, whether it's uh, propranol, or whether it's oxytocin, um, these are clearly affecting our, uh, in Kantian terms, our heteronymous self, our empirical self, our biological nature and are leading to choices being different on that basis, rather than on the basis of purely reflecting on reasons. So if we take the Kantian view, uh, then that would seem to be a loss of something of unconditional value, the idea of, of acting on uh, out of goodwill. <coughs> but I don't think that we should accept this view of human nature, and I I uh, don't think we should for roughly the reasons that, that Julian outlined. Um, I take it that we are evolved beings with a biological nature. Uh, yes, certainly we've evolved to have the capacity to use reason and to understand reason, but I don't think that reason uh, can operate entirely in a vacuum. I think it requires 
Some of those things that, that Julian put on, on the screen in his overheads requires, for example, um, uh, sympathetic awareness of the situations of others, uh, em empathy, you could describe it, and um, it does seem that the levels of empathy that we have with others, the levels of sympathetic awareness of what they are experiencing, what they are feeling, um, are affected by things other than pure reason. Uh, and uh, so I think the idea that we um, are operating out of one or the other um, really uh, is, is not an idea that we can accept, that we can put together with our contemporary understanding of human nature and of human action. So um, given that, then I think we need to at least modify that idea that somehow there are some circumstances in which we act purely from a good will and that this has uh, unconditional moral value and there are other circumstances in which we act from other motives and this lacks that kind of value. So uh, if that is the notion of moral freedom that is being defended uh, and if that is to be used as uh, an argument for objecting to moral enhancement, I think it rests on an untenable view of what human freedom really is like. Uh, I think that we have to take a view which is something that um, accepts, is compatibly with what we understand by human freedom and free choice, accepts that there are a variety of causal factors that uh, will be influences on the outcomes of our decisions. And that's not uh, a bad thing, that's not to be regretted. Um, it's not as if that means that we no longer have uh, value in the world, the unconditioned value of goodwill. On the contrary, I think we have uh, a lot of other value in the world, and we can certainly, in the way that Julian suggested, try to enhance people's decision making, make them act as, uh, as better, better informed, rational agents, better understanding their situation, and uh, we can find uh, other f bases for value. And um, certainly we can praise people who act out of what we might consider motivation that is closer to this idea of a goodwill, that is we will praise people who act out of the intention to help others uh, and reject uh, malevolent intentions to harm others uh, and we will want to praise that kind of action. Um, we will maybe naturally warm to it in some way because of the kind of beings that we are. We recognize this pro-social cooperative action and we will react positively to it that way. We will also want to encourage it for its consequences um, and its consequences will be to reduce harm and violence to increase welfare overall, and we hope to reduce the likelihood of the catastrophic scenarios that both John and Julian agreed uh, were things that it was very important to avoid. So um, I believe that, that that aspect of freedom is one which we ought to sharply distinguish from the political freedoms that I was talking about before. And um, that we ought not to regard that as sufficient grounds for rejecting the ideas uh, of moral enhancement. The question then that needs to be asked is which of these ideas that are around would lead to a uh, loss of the values that I agree are important of uh, freedom of expression, of political freedom, of democracy, uh, and so on. And um, the question here is partly, uh, certainly the one about what are we talking about and how, <coughs> excuse me, how are we talking about implementing these ideas? Um, uh, and are we talking about doing it as a result of a democratic discussion in which the citizens are aware of and involved in what is happening and make decisions that they believe are for the greater good of society or perhaps for the greater good of the world, 
or are these uh, decisions that are imposed on individuals without their awareness or consent? Um, and if so, uh, at what cost? So um, while it's certainly possible to imagine that we do get to the point where we think it is justifiable to impose moral enhancement on competent adults without their consent, um, I think that we are very, very far from that prospect at present. And I really don't think, if we're, if we're being realistic about do we want to see moral enhancement in any form, do we want to see more research towards it, do we want to see trials, implementation, pilots, um, I don't think that it's, uh, I don't think that we really need to be talking about imposing this on adults without their, uh, competent adults without their consent. There are a lot of things that we can do that fall short of that. So if we are talking about um, uh, various presently feasible techniques, uh, like some of the drugs that were mentioned, or even if we're talking about an imaginary uh, technique like the God machine that was just discussed, um, clearly these could be uh, accepted by some elements of the population with their consent in various ways. And we you know, had an example from Julian about um, maybe uh, couples whose relationship were broken down who might, uh, as a part of an experimental project, consent to uh, oxytocin to help to re-establish trust, which may or may not work, but that seems to me to be an interesting kind of example of something that we should be thinking about. Um, the more serious things would be uh, things which inhibit violence among uh, psychopathic criminals. And this, I think, is, is something which also can be discussed and is something that is something that could be done in a sense voluntarily. Voluntarily, of course, in the context in which you have psychopathic criminals uh, who have been convicted of serious crimes and are likely to spend the rest of their lives in prison uh, or something close to the rest of their lives in prison <laughs> under present laws. And I haven't heard objections to those present laws. I mean, there may well be freedom-based objections to blocking up people for uh, 20, 30, 40 years, um, but they're going to have to be argued in the basis of the alternatives uh, and the evidence, which seems to be strong, which uh, Julian Mander, uh, mentioned, I think, uh, that 1% um, of the population is responsible for 50% of uh, serious violent crimes, um, depending, of course, on how you draw those, those categories. But if, if that's so, and if we can identify some people who have been convicted of violent crimes as being at very high risk of convicting further violent crimes, then the case for long-term incarceration is fairly strong. If we have a technique, if we imagine a technique like the God Machine, which um, people would be able to use and would, would successfully prevent them committing those violent crimes, then it seems an option to say to these people, look, you're facing the, the next 40 years of your life in prison, or you can agree to have this machine implanted. Now, um, I don't see that that is a constraint on liberty, uh, other than the constraint that I've already mentioned of uh, incarceration, which I believe to be justifiable. Um, it's the same with, obviously, with, with, with some treatments for, for sex offenders. Uh, I think those, those are options that we would be entirely justified in offering to those people, and I don't see a cost <coughs> in freedom in doing so. Um, it's also possible that we could uh, identify people who have not yet been convicted of these crimes, but are at high risk of conviction. Now, then you could offer them these, uh, these devices, um, but of course you would not have, you would not be in a position to say, um, at least under our laws that are at present, you would not be in a position to say, if you don't accept them, you will spend the rest of your life in prison because we require conviction for some offence. We might get to the point where the science is strong enough, predictable enough, and this has been discussed in movies and novels and so on, where we might feel we're justified in some constraints of people at very high risk of committing violent crimes, 
but that's a separate debate. Um, I think that uh, we would be justified in offering people the choice of having these devices because we could say to them, um, otherwise you are highly likely to commit violent crimes which will lead to you being in prison. They might refuse. Um, and if they do refuse, they may end up committing those crimes and that would be a tragedy for the victims uh, as well as being a bad thing for them. But that too would seem to me to be not a restriction of freedom. Now, John said at one point in his discussion that he gave me a sense that if we have these machines somehow, we've got them forever. Um, he, he said that this, raises, that this is like selling yourself into slavery. Um, I just don't see that, and maybe John you'll explain uh, later in the discussion. Um, the point about selling yourself into slavery is that you cannot say, okay, well, I've now tried this for two years and I've decided I don't like it, I want to go back to where I am before. Obviously, your master says, too bad, here's a contract, you sold yourself into slavery. We presume we're talking about lifetime slavery. But I don't see why that's at all a necessity with the kind of device that is being discussed here, uh, nor for that matter with some kind of uh, uh, going on some drug treatment. I don't see why we can't... Uh, the machine itself could even prompt people. Um, it could say, uh, it could be programmed so that every month it asks you, um, do you wish to continue on this machine? Yes, no. Um, and you have the option of getting off it. Um, if you're on some drugs, something similar obviously could happen. You could have uh, the opportunity, you could be confronted with the fact that you are taking these drugs, that this has affected your behavior in some way, um, and you could be confronted with the opportunity to choose to accept, to, to continue or not. So um, if, if done in these ways, um, I think that the uh, various techniques that we're discussing are not causing a loss of the values of freedom that uh, I've been talking about. <coughs> Having said that, let me just say a little bit about the deeper philosophical question on which uh, Julian and John also differed. Um, suppose that uh, we are persuaded at some point, as I say, I think we're a long way from this, but suppose we are persuaded at some point that the dangers uh, of global catastrophe that uh, John and Julian referred to, whether they are uh, nuclear war, nuclear uh, bioterrorism, uh, or something else of that sort, um, are so great that we need to make this kind of moral enhancement universal, that we can't leave anyone out of it. Um, if that's so, then, uh, and, if, and assuming that there are people who do not consent, informed, uh, competent adults who do not consent to taking part in this treatment, um, do we have a situation where the loss of, of freedom could be justified? Uh, so, on this question, uh, which is one of those ultimate philosophical choices, uh, I do side with, with Julian rather than with John. Uh, freedom is, is extremely important. Um, I hope that we can always preserve freedom of competent adults to make their choices. But if we became convinced that the extinction of uh, intelligent life on this planet were uh, highly probable unless we sacrificed freedom in this way. Uh, would be, I'm assuming it would be a freedom of, of, of the minority who did not wish to accept this. Um, then given that choice of values, uh, I think that we ought to accept the loss of freedom. Uh, clearly it does depend to some extent on the odds because we're talking about freedom uh, as a value, we're agreeing that freedom is a value, um, but we're also agreeing that continued intelligent life on this planet is a, uh, a value, and um, uh, without continued intelligent life we lose freedom as well. So nobody wants that, even the, the adherents of freedom don't want that either. Rather, as I think John put it at one point, um, they're prepared to take a chance on this. They're prepared to say, well, I think freedom is such a huge value that if there is some chance that we can preserve intelligent life on Earth, 
with freedom, I'll take that chance, even if it's a small chance, rather than the much higher probability of continuing intelligent life on Earth, but without freedom. I would, I would not, I, I mean, you know, at least there's, there, there are some odds at which I would say I would not want to take that chance. Um, and one reason for this is that I think we do need to look at the long-term future. Um, I don't accept the idea that even if we implemented this, whatever it might be, form of moral enhancement at uh, a global level, which meant that there were some competent adults who did not consent who had it imposed on them, um, I don't accept that that would mean necessarily the loss of freedom for everyone or for everybody in the future, given that our species survives, which we assume it will have better chances of survival. Because um, the majority may be uh, highly in favor of this, may accept it for themselves, and um, the loss of freedom therefore may be small, and, and in time um, people may come to, the, the situation may change, the context may change, so we may feel, well, we don't really need to impose this on people anymore, we have better safeguards against whatever those dangers might be, um, we can therefore scale back the uh, kind of enhancement and we may have achieved a world in which that kind of uh, higher level of morality comes about without any coercion on anyone. And I would hope, in fact, that that is the case. I would hope that uh, we do make moral progress through cognitive enhancement. Um, and I'm, I'll close on, on this note. It's something that uh, Julian mentioned that um, he and uh, Ingmar Persson have, have discussed um, and has been discussed. But I think there is evidence that um, achieving a better cognitive understanding does actually help to enhance us morally, maybe not sufficiently to deal with the existential risks that we are facing. But um, I'd recommend you, if you don't already know it, that you take a look at a relatively recent book by Steven Pinker called The Better Angels of Our Nature, which is a, brings together a massive amount of, of research on uh, the decline in violence um, throughout the millennia of human existence. And uh, there may be people who are skeptical about has there indeed been a decline in violence over the millennia of human existence? But I think Pinker makes a very convincing case that the answer is yes, um, that your, the chances of any human individual of uh, meeting a violent death uh, were much higher 5,000 years ago than they were 2,000 years ago. Um, they were much higher 2,000 years ago than they were, say, uh, five or 600 years ago. Um, they were much higher five or 600 years ago than they were a century ago, and that they are continuing to decline uh, and have declined uh, throughout the last couple of centuries, obviously with some uh, terrible aberrations, but we're in the, in the mid-20th mid century, but we're looking at long-term trends, and that they have continued to decline over the last 50 or 60 years. Um, the discussion of the causes of this is, is really interesting. Pinker goes into quite a lot of that, but he does think that one of the causes is actually a growth in uh, the not necessarily the ultimate abilities to reason, but in the ways in which we reason and the ways in which we uh, are capable of thinking about our options and our choices. Um, that he, he dates this, the most recent changes anyway, to the development of the printing press in, in Europe and the spread of uh, international discussions in Europe across national boundaries because of, uh, because of the greater ease caused by the printing press and then greater communications as we have moved forward. And of course, we are now in an age where we have the greatest possible ease of uh, global communications, both uh, in terms of, of new services, but also in terms of one-to-one -one individual communications through the internet, which I think we can reasonably hope are also going to be a factor in uh, increasingly 
abilities to understand each other, to know more about each other, uh, and to think about our own situation in a critical way, which there is some hope for thinking in the long run, and again, assuming that we can overcome some of the dangers that we do face in the more short-term future, are going to be factors that lead to a higher level of uh, ethical thought and ethical behaviour as well sometime uh, over the next century. Thank you very much.